The late 1960s were a time of transition. There was a shift from the way things were to the way things should be through fearless activism. Following demonstrations earlier on in the decade, the advancement of civil rights loomed. yet could not escape the country's racist wrath in taking out leaders of the movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., civil rights leader and Nobel Prize winner, was shot and killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. Don't shop for anything on Capitol Street. Let's let the merchants down on Capitol Street feel the economic pinch. In a vacant lot about 40 yards away, a sniper fired a single shot from a high-powered rifle at Evers' silhouette. The bullet hit him in the back, crashed through his body, through a window into the house. He died within an hour at a Jackson hospital. To reinforce the common bond of purpose between our people by submerging all of our differences and establishing non-sectarian constructive programs for human rights. We hereby present this charter. Number one, the establishment. The 1960s saw protests in sports that lasted throughout time. Muhammad Ali took a stand for the ages against the injustice of the Vietnam War. Tommy Smith and John Carlos protested in the Mexico City Games of 1968, disgraced former IOC president Avery Brundage, expelled them from the games. However, one protest that flies under the radar comes in 1968 in the same sport as Smith and Carlos's. Brigham Young, the Mormon University located in Provo, Utah, was not a welcoming environment for even the most religious minorities in the 1960s. You see, back in the day, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now known as BYU, prohibited black people from holding ecclesiastical positions in the faith. The Salt Lake City-based church also barred black men and women from most of its sacred temple ceremonies. The church taught that the restriction was God's will, wrote Gary James Bergera. At the University of Texas, El Paso was Bob Beeman, who made a jump so great it would break the world record at the time. With the discrimination coming at BYU, plus the death of Martin Luther King occurring just four days prior to their meet, UTEP track took a stand. A small collection of black athletes held a meeting and made a decision. They were going to boycott the Easter weekend meet against BYU. Their coach, Wayne Vandenberg, seen here, had practically encouraged past protests. Then, at the drop of a hat, he changed his mind. You've competed against them in the indoor conference championships and there was no issues. So now we're making it an issue? Sit out the meet, he told them, and they'd be off the team. Joe Watts of the Daily Herald wrote, seven black UTEP track stars have announced that they will not participate in the track meet schedule that BYU and head coach Wayne Vandenberg said. If they don't compete, they won't remain on the track team. When the rest of the team departed, Eight black UTEP track athletes, including world indoor long jump record holder Bob Beeman, stayed at home in protest over the team's part in a triangular meet in Provo. Vandenberg said those who did not make the flight to Provo would voluntarily remove themselves from the team. The Oroville Mercury Register wrote the eight issued a statement that said they would boycott the meet because of BYU's belief that black people are inferior and that we are disciples of the devil. The athletes who joined Beeman were team captain David Morgan, Charles McPherson, Kelly Mybrick Jr., Jose LaFischel, Jimmy Love, and Levi Portis. Who the hell wants to go up there and run your tail off in front of a bunch of spectators who think you've got horns? And it was Easter week, and it seemed to us that there was an obvious connection between the martyrdom of Jesus and the martyrdom of Dr. King. To a white, it might be nothing. To us, it had a great significance, Morgan told SI. John Nichols, a black man competing for UTEP's track team in Provo, was racially abused by a teammate. That teammate kept calling him black boy. Nichols also told SI, I knocked him on his ass. Then he refused to compete. In effect, he too was kicked off the track team. Coach Vandenberg took a reporter aside and said, they're finished. There's no special rules for blacks and whites or greens and pinks. I'm hired to do the best job according to my ability to decide all these things for everybody. And I decided I didn't kick them off. They quit. I lost my scholarship, Beeman said, but I never lost focus on preparing myself for the Olympic team. I stayed right in the pocket. Vandenberg appeared peeved with what transpired with his track team. However, 
peeved would be an understatement for the fallout that occurred following the athletes' protest. Beeman's wife overqualified for her position in the first place, lost her job. Look, I can't get involved in this thing. You can't have the job, her boss told her. A bank officer rang him asking if he would be able to pay his bills. Beeman says, was it pressure? I don't know, but I do know that the whole town was against us. Beeman, meanwhile, continued training, even breaking his own world records. Then, at the 68 games, he won the gold medal. Beeman's leap of 29 feet, two and a half inches, which far surpassed the record of 27 feet, four and three fourths inches, was the stuff of legend, wrote the undefeated's Liam Boylan Pett. More protests would occur against BYU, including the Black 14, the story of the Wyoming football players who took matters into their own hands. Beeman would protest once more, raising his fist at the Mexico City Games just two days after Smith and Carlos's courageous stance on the medal stand. I felt very comfortable with that protest of how African Americans were treated in the United States at the time, Beeman added. He was not suspended or punished for his stance. Some 13 years later, after UTEP's protests, Brigham Young University ceased its bigoted practice in 1978. After losing his scholarship, Beeman went on to graduate with a degree in sociology from Adelphi University in 1972. In that same year, he had retired from track and field with one gold medal from one Olympics. In 1983, he became one of the first athletes to be inducted into the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Hall of Fame.